in the in the tabernacle, and if you're new to church, I'll, I'll explain some of some of this. But in the tabernacle, tabernacle, and the tabernacle just means a tent. And the tabernacle was a place where the people of Israel used to meet with God. They used to meet with Him, and so tabernacle. Whenever you hear that word especially preached or whatever, just understand it just means a tent. It just means a place to meet. And it was a place where the, the Israelites met with God. And the tabernacle eventually became what was known in Jerusalem as the temple. And it, was a it became a more, a, a, a more permanent structure. And so in the temple, and we've got to understand there were certain procedures and certain things that they did inside the temple, and we've understood, and, and again, if you're here today and you've been listening to some of the messages I've been preaching over the last few months, you would understand today, because that temple no longer exists in Jerusalem. The Romans destroyed it. But you would understand today that we are that temple. You, you would understand that we, 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 we are that temple. We are that tabernacle. Uh, we are the place where God dwells. And so when you're looking at the Bible, everything you see, like the temples and tabernacles, they are all shadows. They are all symbols. They are all representations of spiritual things, physical things that represent spiritual things that help us understand, I guess, how God works in the midst of his creation. And so in the temple and tabernacle in Jerusalem, there stood a piece of furniture. I'm going to talk about furniture today. But there stood a piece of furniture called the golden lampstand. And to the Hebrew, it was known as the menorah. It was situated in what is called the holy place, which is just before the most holy place, the place where God's presence resides. And so the golden lampstand stood there. And in the temple and in the tabernacle there, were, tabernacle, there were no windows. And so it was dark in there. And so the golden lampstand lit up that area, lit up that space. And it was something that was made of pure gold. It was made of pure gold, which is different than every other piece of furniture in the tabernacle. Because not every... Piece of, a lot of stuff pretty much in the tabernacle had gold overlaid over acacia wood and so on. But this was the only thing that was actually made purely of gold. And we need to understand what does gold represent? Gold represents in, uh, uh, divinity. Gold represents deity, purity. Gold, gold represents so many different things in, in Scripture. But God had given the pattern for the temple. God had given the pattern for the, uh, the tabernacle. And he'd certainly given the pattern for how the lampstand was to be built. In Exodus 25 verse 31, it says, Make a lampstand of pure gold. And sometimes you can read these scriptures and you don't know what they mean. And uh, I, I, I know too, I can read this and it's like, I, I, kinda, I don't know how to understand this and I hope I help you today. It says, make a lampstand of pure gold. This is, this, is, this is a piece of furniture you ain't going to shift easy, right? You're going to put it where you put it and you don't move it. Some say it's about 40 kgs of gold. So make a lampstand of pure gold, hammer out its base and shaft, and make its flower like cups, buds, and blossoms. Everybody say cups, buds, and blossoms. Make it of one piece with them. Six branches are to extend from the side of the lampstand. Three on one side and three on the other. Three cups shaped like almond flowers with buds and blossoms are to be on one branch. Three on the next branch and the same for all six branches extending from the lampstand. And on that lampstand there are to be four cups. Here it is. Repeat again. Shaped like almond flowers with buds and blossoms. One bud shall be under the first pair of branches extending from the lampstand, a second bud under the second pair, and a third bud under the third pair. Six branches in all. The buds and the branches shall all be hammered out of pure gold. Then make its seven lamps and set them up on it so that they light up the space in front of it. Its wick, its trimmers, and trays are to be of pure gold. A talent of pure gold is to be used for the lampstand and all these accessories. See that you make them according to the pattern shown to you on the mountain. 
God is into patterns. God is into planning things. Sometimes we just think, well, God just for no, no. God is into planning. He is into patterns. He he understand. You've got to understand. He works these things all through the scriptures. If we're here today and you go, well, I've read that, but I don't understand. What does that look like? What does the golden uh, lamp stand uh, look like? Well, take a look at this first slide here, if, uh, just to get a picture or a rough idea of what this lamp stand. Uh, looks like and here we have the almond buds as described as I was talking to you about before but now that you've seen this for many people you'd go oh I recognize that I I, I recognize that uh, what that is it's uh, uh, again it, it's, it's one of the most I guess recognizable symbols even today in the land of Israel it features prominently through, throughout all their art and so on. And so this is known as the menorah. This is not a candle stand. Okay, this is a lamp. And it's very important that you understand that. But like I said, I, I'm guessing now that you've seen it, you go, ah, oh, that's what that's talking about. I have, I have perhaps seen that, especially if you've been around the Bible for a while. You go, yes, I, I, I know what that is. I, I've, I've seen that. And so here's the thing, as I've looked in, because I've been doing a bit of study on this, as you, you know, I've been talking about the altar and the fire and uh, all that and how it must burn, and this was another lamp that must burn continuously. But as I've been looking into this, I, I just get fascinated, I get amazed again at, at all the symbolism that I, that I find in the Scriptures, at all the symbolism that I find all through, throughout the Bible. And of course, as I look at this, the menorah, I, I, there is more symbolism in this than we can actually cover, uh, cover today. There are so many things. In fact, if you, if you look at this, one of the things that symbolizes is the book of life. It actually, sorry, the, the tree of life, the tree of life. And so when, when you see this, it symbolizes in the tabernacle, the tree of life. It, it also, another thing it symbolizes is light in the darkness. A light in the darkness. As you, as you know, there, there, there was no, as I said before, there was no windows in the tabernacle. And this was the thing that brought light into that place. And so when you look at this lamp, I want you to understand the pattern, the, the, the number of lamps and, that are laid out there, which way the lamps are facing, the, the oil. And of course, we know the oil represents the Holy Spirit. There's so, there's so much symbolism here. You, you've got to understand... That, that, that when you see these pieces of furniture in the tabernacle and in the temple, and especially this piece of furniture, every part of it, every part of it, the way the lamps face and so on and so forth, every part of it symbolizes the powerful redemptive work of God. Every part of this golden lampstand has meaning. But today I, I just want to share one thing that I guess has inspired me or encouraged me, and I hope that it encourages you. I, I, I hope at the end you go, that, that was interesting, that helped me. Or uh, if, you, if it doesn't, just don't tell me. Just go out and say, nice, Pastor. <laughs> but I pray it would encourage you, because it, whenever I look at this, what it, what it does is it, it reminds me how intricately God is involved in all the details. And how he has woven his truth into the pattern of all that he does. How he's woven his pattern into all that he creates. And, and also the way he hides these patterns. The way they are hidden and then revealed in and throughout the Bible. This most ancient of books. And as... You know, we go through this, you might say, well, it's just a coincidence. I, I just, I, I, I don't know how, but the, 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 more, the more I learn, the more I realize there are things I just don't know. And the more I can see that this book is a miracle and that this book uh, has, is incredible. I want you to grab that today because we live in a world that's challenging the authenticity of this book. But when I see God's handiwork, in and throughout this book, I never cease to be amazed. And it affirms to me, like I've said, that this book is a miracle. See, on the golden lampstands, according to the pattern laid out, we, we see the branches here and we see the shaft. You can, let's go to the next um, 
the next one you can say this is a little bit clearer but you can you can see the shaft laid out there in the branches again representing a, a tree and then on the branches and on the shaft you can see the almond flowers why the almond flower who likes almond nuts um yeah 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 so some of you are not too sure you're just concentrating hard but they're al almond flowers. Why are they almond flowers? Well, simply because almonds represent new life. They represent new birth. Why? Because the almond in the Near East, you can go and you can Google it. They're your Bible study resource. You can Google it and find out that in the Near East, the almond flowers are the first to blossom. When the seasons change, and I, I don't know if they have four seasons over there, but, but when, when the summer is coming, when the spring or when the new dawn is coming, it's almonds that blossom first. It's the sign of a new, new day is coming. It's, it's a sign of new life is coming. And so you can see these almond flowers. There's four on the shaft and three on each branch. But as we heard before, and the pattern laid out in Exodus, which we read out before, with every single almond blossom on the menorah, they consist of three parts. So every almond blossom has three parts, and they are the cups, the buds, and the blossoms. The cups, the buds, and the blossoms. Now, I, I, I don't know who sits down and figures all this stuff out. I, I don't know who sits down and, and every now and then goes, hey, let's count this and figure out this and see. But there are people, they do this for a living, right? There are scholars who sit down, people who are interested in biblical numerology or whatever, and they, they will work this out and count this out and, and figure this out and go, here's a pattern. And I, I, I don't know uh, uh, how these people do this or why they do it. But, but we know if you've been around the Bible for a while, you know that numbers are significant, right? You know that numbers and, and multiples of numbers have different meanings in the Bible. Things like if, if you think about the number 40, number 40 in Bible is what? It's the number of testing. It's the number of trials. How long was Noah in the ark? 40, 40 days. He went through the trial. How long was Jesus in the wilderness? 40 days. 40 is the number, uh, number of trial. How, how long did they wander and the Israelites wander in the wilderness? 40, 40 years. And so you can see these patterns and things throughout uh, out Scripture. So 40 is the number of testing and trial. Uh, when we think about the number 50, what's the number 50? Well, 50 represents uh, uh, Pentecost, and uh, 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 it represents new birth again. It, re uh, it represents a uh, new season. It represents the year of Jubilee. Well, what's the year of Jubilee? The, the year of restoring all things, where slaves were set free, where, where debts were for, how would like some debts forgiven? I mean, it was just, that's how, how it was. Oh, you're all happy with any debt. <laughs> no, it's just like, you, you've got to understand, these numbers meant things. The number seven is what? Number seven is the number of completeness. For God made the, 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 you know, the first day, the second day, third day, fourth day, fifth day, sixth day, and on the seventh day, he what? He rested. He rested. So seventh is that the number of completeness. completeness. All things are complete. The number, it's also the number of perfection. Six is the number of man. The number 10 is is the number of law. And where would you see that? You see that in the Ten Commandments. And so numbers mean certain things in the Bible. Twelve is the number of government. And so you have 12 tribes. You have 12 disciples. And of course, if you're an Iron Maiden fan, you would know one of the most popular numbers in the Bible. Someone sprayed it on our gate one time. You would know that 666 is the number of the beast. At least somebody knows their Bible out there. And, and so they sprayed it on the gate. But that's the Iron Maiden back in my old days. They did this famous song, 666, the number of the beast. That's not how it went. It was much better than that. Well, I don't know if it's good. Maybe it wasn't good. Don't listen to it. But again, we know numbers mean certain, certain things. And Kevin Connor, who I'd regard as a very close to our uh, movement uh, as, a, as a scholar and a theologian. He pointed out, but not just him, many people have pointed this out the more I've studied, studied this. But he said this, he said, notice this, that there are on the menorah, if you count the buds and the flowers, like, like I said, there's so much symbolism here, we can only do one thing. But he said, if you count them, they come to 22, 1, 2, 3, 4, and you, say, you can start counting them uh, as we go. But you will see that there are 22 buds 
on the menorah. And each of those buds are made up of three parts, right? Cups, buds, and blossoms. Each of them has three parts. And so if you take those three parts and you say 22 times 3 or 3 times 22, it comes to the number 66. And so here's what blows my mind away. If you take 66 and you ask the question, how many books are in the Bible? Well, there are 60. Yeah, it's not a trick question. It's just not a trick question. And the canon, Protestant canon of, of Scripture, how many books are in the Bible? 66. It's not a trick. There are 66 books in the Bible. Now, I just want to say, we have to understand also, even as I say that, that at the time the lamp was, was uh, uh, being built, the Bible did not exist. The Bible did not exist. And so, to me, it's interesting to, to me that there are 66 buds here, because here's what the Bible says in Psalm 119. It says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet. And a light unto my path. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And again, you can say, oh, maybe it was just a coincidence, but it, I don't know about you, but it kind of blows my mind that that can somehow be in here when the. At that time, the canon of Scripture, the Old Testament hadn't even been formed. The, the, I mean, it was a, the psalm had not been written. No one sat down and go, well, let's make a pattern here. It amazes me. There were 66 books are in the Scripture and 66 buds, cups, buds and blossoms are on the, word, uh, on the, on the lamp. Thy word... Is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Uh, then if you, you, you take that and you, like I said, there are so many things. If we talked about the, 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 the seven lamps, if you go to the book of Revelation, you look at the seven golden lampstands there, which represent the church and how Christ is moving among them. There are so, there are so, so many things, but I, I digress. If I go in there, just again, to just show a point, because how this... This works out. If you take the shaft, the main shaft, one, two, three, four, and you take all the other ones on the left side, the other buds, and you count them, count them up. I want to just tell you, it's no, again, two, uh, there, there are 39. There are 39. If you count these buds on the shaft, the main shaft, and these buds here, there are 39. How many books are in the Old Testament? There are 39. Again, considering when I, when, I, when I think about this, it just blows, blows my mind. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. If we were then to take that, and that's 39, and we were to count the remaining ones on there, times three, guess how many there would be? 27. Guess how many books are in the New Testament? Yeah, 27. It's, it's not a trick question. It's, there, there, there are 27. Thy word. All 66 books. All 39 in the Old Testament. All 27 in the New Testament. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And see, when I consider, and this is what blows me, Blows me away when I consider, because this is not like one person wrote this book and thought, well, I'll just put all these patterns in there. When we understand that the, the magnitude of this book, the miracle of this book, the fact that it had more, uh, uh, pr pretty much around about 40 authors, 40 authors, and they didn't just write a few years apart from each other. Listen, this book was written over a period, over a length of period of 1,600 years, 1,600 years. And it was written by people from all different backgrounds. It was written by kings and shepherds, by fishermen and doctors. It blows my mind. Yet, the fact that it all fits so amazingly together as if it's like one book. Thy word is a lamb unto my feet. All 66 books, 39 in the old, 27 
in the new. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And it just reminds me of in an age of relativism, in an age where people are challenging the scripture and God's, God's word, it just reminds me that all scripture is breathed. Breathed out by God, it says in 2 Timothy 3, verse 16. It reminds me that the Word of God is living and active and sharper. The detail, the fact that these things are woven in. Then any two-edged sword, piercing the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And so when I hear stuff like this and you see this, and there's so many other patterns. If we start to count the amount of how many scrolls the Old Testament is written on and so on, there's so many numbers in here that just blow my... How could someone work that out? What are the chances? It just reminds me that this is a miracle book that can be trusted. You know, the God... Golden lampstand, it represents what? It represents and symbolizes God's light. It represents and symbolizes God's new life. And it represents and symbolizes God's word. And of course, in the truest sense, the lamp represents Jesus, who was the word. Who the Bible says the word became flesh, who was the true light of the world. In John chapter 1, verse 1 in the Gospels, it begins like this. It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. With Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life, and that life was the light, was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Jesus said this. He said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Jesus is the living word. He's the living word and light. Jesus is the true lamp. And again, everything points to Christ. All 66 books, all 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New Testament. As we've said, the new is in the old concealed. The old is in the new revealed. Revealed in who? Revealed in Christ. Concealed in the old, in symbols, types, and shadows, but revealed in the new, in Christ, the life and light of the world. My challenge is to us these days, will you let this word be the lamp to your feet? Will you let this word be the lamp that guides your life. Not social media, not the government, not Google, not e even what anybody else's best idea is. Would you let this word be the lamp? Oh, it stood true for thousands of years. I want to encourage us to be people of the book. Let this book be the lamp that guides your life. Let it be the lamp that guides your marriage. Let it be the lamp that guides your testimony. Let it be the lamp that guides your behavior. Let it be the lamp that guides your witness. Let it be the lamp who, uh, that, 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 that uh, uh, guides your work ethic. May it be the la lamp that guides your morality. Yeah. Live in a crazy world. Let it be the lamp that governs your choices. Yeah. Let it be the lamp that rules you richly yeah. and brings favor to you. Yeah. Let it be the lamp that guards your children. 
teach it to them. That when they're older, they will not depart from it. Let it be the lamp that discerns your way. Let it be the lamp that discerns your words and what you say. Let this lamp that God has planned and patterned be the thing that you hold dear. And let it be the thing that guides your life. Don't just sit it on the shelf. Oh, I'm a Christian. It's on the shelf. No. Let it lead you. Let it guide you. This book is a miracle. His pattern for how we should live is found in it. God, we thank you today for your word. We thank you today that we have more versions of the Bible than any other people in history. Father, we thank you today that it's been more studied, more pulled to part, more, more, more uh, um, insights gathered. Than we, 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 we have such a richness. And so God, today, God, this lamp unto our feet, this light unto our path, Father, may we be ones who would use it to lead and guide our lives in all that we do. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Well, I hope that you found that interesting. If you didn't, don't tell me. Because it'll just hurt. No. <laughs> but again, there are so many things that we can learn from the scriptures. There are so many things that we can grow with and learn, learn from. And anyway, I'm muttering. I'm muttering. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you. The Lord be gracious to you give you peace peace in your family peace in your life peace in your health peace in your in your children God give us peace